Welcome everyone to the fifth and final video for Excel and Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to cover three additional problems. The first of which is a, a regression analysis of real-world data. Secondly, I'll show you a matrix function that allows you to transpose data. So in case you get it from a source and you want to transpose it for later evaluation or to create a report or whatsoever, um, You'll be able to do that and I'll show you how. And lastly, we'll evaluate a survey. So if you, for example, want to write a seminar paper or a thesis where you have to do an evaluation of a survey, I'll show you how to quickly do counts and descriptive analysis of the results you're getting. Let's first start with project 10. It's about Occam's law and We'll use data from the World Economic Outlook database from the International Monetary Fund for Japan. And to do Occam's law, we'll need the cross domestic product and the unemployment rate of, in our case, Japan. Um, in the following pages, you find a detailed a description where you get the data from in case you need it. And what we finally need is, or what Occam's law says, is that there is a relationship, a linear one, between the growth rate of the gross domestic product and the change of the unemployment rate. So if the growth rate of the gross domestic product is positive or very much positive, then, of course, the change in the unemployment rate will be negative. So the unemployment rate will be decreasing. Whereas if the growth rate of the gross domestic product is negative, the unemployment rate will increase. So the change is positive. So here are the tasks. First, we have a data set that is written in rows. We'll see that in a minute. So we'll have to transpose it. And we copy paste um, with the specialty of transposing the inserted values. Second, we create a linear model to answer the question what change we would expect if the GDP decreases by 5.369%. And finally, we answer how, how high the unemployment rate then is. So let's do that project 11. So you see the data is written in rows, which is really not very good to work with. So what we do is we press Control, Shift, arrow down, arrow to the right to highlight all the data here. And we copy it, Control C or copy. And then you right click in cell A5. And you find several paste options. And the fourth one is a transpose type of paste. And you click on that and the data will be um, pasted, transposed. So let us first see what we have here. So we have GDP constant prices, that is very good, annual percentage change. So this, for, for an example, is an annual change of 3.181% negative 2%, positive 2%, negative 0.7%. And remember, this was the explanatory variable. So using the annual change in the gross domestic product can predict how the unemployment rate will change. So this is our x variable. Let's just write x. So in second, we have the unemployment rate as a percentage of the population in Japan. But what we actually need is the change in the unemployment rate. And to do so, we can just, or in order to calculate it, we can, we can just write a small formula starting with an equal sign and say um, the change obviously is what we currently have minus what we had the year before. So here I expect something around 0.2. So obviously the change between 1980 and 1981 is 
So this is an equation, so I make it a highlighted in, in yellow. Double click here on the bottom right to copy it downwards. And this is our y variable. So this is what we're trying to predict. So we pasted it, the, the values, we pasted the values transposed. Question B, which changes in unemployment rate do you expect according to the regression equation for the year 2009 if the GDP actual decreases by 5.369%? So what we need is first the linear model. And then we have an assumed observation in 2009 of 5.369% as our observed x value. Question is, what is this? To answer um, part or sub question B, and then sub question C will be, what is this? The capital as well. So. And as we learned in, a, in the previous project, we need an intercept and a slope. So intercept, slope. We calculate the intercept by using the function intercept, intercept, known y values. So these are all these. And then of course, known x values can only be those starting in 1981 because we don't have a y value for 1980. So both x's and y's have to be the same amount of elements that we're handing over to that function. And we cannot say the change was zero in 2080. That doesn't make sense. We just don't know what happened before that. So we don't know the y value, so we can only have values starting from 1981. And the same accounts for the slope. So function slope pass over all y values and then all x values starting in 81 will return the slope. And to answer b, we just insert the newly observed value of 5.369% change to our uh, um, regression model. So this is intercept plus slope times the percentage change in, um, in the gross domestic product. But I think in fact that should be negative, um, let me see if the GDP decreases by 5 point. So this should be a minus 5.369. Yep. So if the GDP decreases by 5.369%, the change in the unemployment rate would be about 0.7. And if the unemployment rate in, uh, increases by 0.7 percentage points, Obviously, the unemployment rate itself would be the value from 2008 plus whatever change we had or will have. And this is the answer to C. So if the gross domestic product decreases by 5.369% in 2009, we forecast a change in the unemployment rate by 0.689 percentage points, which yields a total unemployment rate of about 4.677%. And that was project 11. Let's go on to project 12. Transposition of matrices and geometric means. So we found in the, in the previous project that the data written row-wise was not very practical and like good to handle to do an analysis. So we had to copy and paste it 
which is kind of a bad idea because if you replace some of the original data that is written row wise, you have to copy paste it again. So instead, what we want is a matrix function that refers to the original data. And once we change something in the original data, it will also automatically change in the transposed data. And for this, we use the matrix function mtrans. So matrix transpose. <clears throat> So we have in project 12, we have provided the gross domestic product growth of Japan. We're supposed to calculate the average growth. For this, we first have to write growth rates and then calculate the geometrical mean because growth rates grow geometrically, not linearly. And then we need to have the geometrical mean. Um, Finally, once we've done that, we should do a cross check and assume the GDP in 1980 is 1000 monetary units. And we let it grow first by the actual growth rate and then second by the average growth rate that we calculated. And if our calculation was correct in 2008, they should have exactly the same monetary units um, in GDP. So you see here's the data the original one. So what we first need to do is highlight the target area, which fortunately here is kind of framed in this yellow frame. So what I do is I click in the first cell here, scroll down to um, row 43, press shift and hold shift, and then I click with the left mouse button on D43. <clears throat> and while this area is highlighted, I start typing, I think in English it's transpose. Um, I'll change that in the slide set in a second. Um, and then I highlight the area that I actually want to transpose. So I click on the first element, which is what B5. Hold Control, Shift, arrow down, arrow to the right. And then I hold Control and Shift and press Enter. And if you've done it correctly, you see in the formula bar that we have this weird parentheses around the equation. And you cannot delete a single element of this array. So it tells you you can, charge, you can change a part of this array. Because this whole thing as a total is one element and not any one cell, but the whole whole vector or the whole matrix here is one element. Next thing we do is we transform these annual percentage changes into growth rates. And we'll do that by writing equal sign this value divided by 100 and at 1. So from, from 3.181, we get to 1.03181. This is, just make that different color so you know what I uh, inserted. Copy that equation down. And it fills out till um, row 43. And then we calculate the geometric average or the geo mean of all these numbers. So the average growth rate of all these growth rates is 2.45%. And as a cross check, what we do is we pretend we have 100 a thousand monetary units here before 1980. And first we say we take the previous year and multiply it with the actual growth rate. Let's do that. And then in 2008, we have 2019 point something monetary units of gross domestic product. So what I, what I did here is 
I just took the previous year or the beginning of the year gross domestic product, multiply it by the actual growth throughout the year, and I know what in the end of the year, beginning of the next year, the monetary units of GDP will be. And because, because these are all relative um, references, so I always go to the cell above the current formula cell and two to the left. Um, I don't need to fixate any of those rows or columns. And then second, so this is the actual, and this is the geomean. So in the geomean, we also start with a thousand. And this time we say we take the previous year and multiply it by the average. And because the average will stay in the same cell here, I have fixate this one so that E45 doesn't change or will never change. I can copy this downwards. You see still here, it will take the previous year's value and multiply it by the average. And finally, in the end, in 2008, we get the same GDP um, independent of whether we took the actual or the geomean um, as a growth rate. And that was project 12. So let's go to 13. So in project 13, we find a data set of exchange rate forecasts on the Turkish lira against the US dollar. And we have different institutes or banks or like research institutes that take part in a survey. So every month or in regular frequency, um, we as a research institute send out letters to all these banks and forecast institutes, rating agencies whatsoever. And we ask them nicely to provide us with their forecasts of the exchange rate Turkish Lira against the US dollar. And obviously those banks do not need to answer or do not need to submit a re response to us and tell us what they think the exchange rate is going to be, but they can. And so every time we send out, out those letters, it might be that sometimes we only get five letters as a response from five banks and the next time it might be seven banks but different ones um, so we cannot force them to to reply and so the the, the questions we're supposed to answer is how, how often has every institute participated in the survey and which one has participated or replied to us the most the second is basically the same but we're asking which bank has replied the least often. Third, in which survey have most institutes participated? So which was the survey where we got the most responses? And then D, we're supposed to create an XY diagram or a scatter plot that looks like this and do a small interpretation of it. Let's first look at the data. So what we see is a bunch of different variables. So year, month, country, and time. And then we see institute ID, the institute, and W1, which is the exchange rate forecast. So call that FX forecast. And then what we see is here we send out we send out our survey in June '99 to I don't know how many institutes or banks, but these were the ones which replied. And this all happened in time ID 45, so we can trace this survey back to 45. Let's frame that. And then there was a different point in time in June 2000, which has the time ID 57. And you see here, the count here is 14. See it in the bottom of the page or in the bottom 
below the the worksheets you see um kind of count on how many cells i have highlighted with content so if i highlight these there's nothing if i highlight um all these you see there are four cells with content and this is this is what it, what it tells me okay anyway we have 14 counts on the survey 57 which tells me that on survey 57 14 responses came back let's highlight that in a different column and if we just have a look at those two surveys we see ABN has responded here, 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 the third one as well. Barclays responded in the first one, not in the second, and so forth. And what we want to know is, how often did each of those institutes respond? And in order to do that, we first need to know which were the institutes that actually responded. So what we do is I highlight all the institutes that ever responded, even if they're there twice or three times. So control shift arrow down and I copy all of these. And I paste it in say column L. Paste. And what I'll do is in the menu category data, we already used the data tool delete duplicates. We do that, press OK, and then it says we have 29 unique values remaining. So in all institutes that ever participated, those 29 were the ones who participated at least once. I'll make, me make that a bit more beautiful, so we don't want the frames here. So let me put it out. Okay. And now the question is how often did ABN respond? How often did, I don't know, Bank of America, Commerce Bank, BNP, and so forth, how often did they respond? And we got to know a small equation that is called V lookup. Oh no, sorry. Count if count if is what we used. So the range in which we're looking is all responding banks. And we fixate that range because if I copy that function or that formula to any other cell, that range will stay exactly in the same space. Then semicolon and for this formula that is written in cell M7, the search criteria is ABN. And that is the relative reference because if I copy that equation or that formula downwards, the criteria in cell M8 will be Barclays, in M9 will be Chase, and so forth. Let me copy that down. And how can we interpret these values? So we know ABN responded three times, Chase two times, CS First Boston 13 times, and so on. And now the question is, which of those responded the most frequent and which the least? Most responses as max out of all these numbers and least is min of all these numbers. So the most responses were 15, and I find that here, and I find it a second time here. So General Motors replied 15 times, and Merrill Lynch also replied 15 times. So how, how often has every institute participated in a survey? General Motors and Merrill Lynch 15 times. And those were the ones that participated the most frequently. 
How often has every institute participated? We calculated that using count if. Which one has participated least often? Um, it was one time, and one time participant were Royal Bank of Canada and ECOSA. So this is A, B, and A corresponds to what I highlighted in yellow and B to blue. Next question. At which survey have most institutes participated? Okay, so we identified time ID as being an identifier for the survey. So here's survey 45, survey 57, and whatever numbers come after that. So in order to count how often or how many responses we got for each of the surveys, we need to know which survey IDs exist. So essentially the same as for the institutes, we copy all of these, put them in column O, and paste the values um, to not have also the borders included. And then in the menu data, remove duplicates. Um, I don't want to expand the section, so I continue with the current selection. And I have 16 unique values remaining. So there was survey 45, 57, 66, 77, and so on. And just to do it a bit differently, so we could use count if as well, but I showed you the function frequency as well. So what I do is I highlight the target area, type an equal sign frequency, and then the data array is here, this area of all data available. And the bins, we said those are kind of the categories. These are these. And I don't have to fixate any of the references that I have because I'm not going to copy my equation. I'm just closing the parentheses, holding Control and Shift, and then pressing Enter. Because remember, this is a matrix function. It works a bit differently. So we find the numbers that we counted ourselves in the beginning. So 40, 45 is seven times. That is correct. So you see, I highlight them to count seven. 57 is 14 times. I think we had that as well. Yep. And now the question is, what is the max? Equal sign max of all these numbers. So the survey with the maximum responses got 19 responses that that was survey 83. So in this survey, 83, in August 2002, 19 banks responded to our request. And so it was the survey that got the most responses of all surveys that we took at which survey have most institutes participated. <clears throat> 83. Um, that leaves us with sub-question D. Create the scatter plot that you find on the next slide. Please interpret your results according to recent developments in the financial markets. So we're supposed to create this. Fortunately, the task tells us already what type of diagram that is. So let's do that. Click in a cell with no neighboring cells having values, then insert. We want to create a scatter plot or XY plot. Get this empty thing again. Select data and then add entries. We don't need a serious name. We need serious X values. And having a look here, it tells us already this x value is time ID and y value is um, the FX forecast. So x value is time ID. Click the first, control, shift, arrow down. 
and then for the y values delete whatever is written in there click on the first w1 control shift arrow down and submit this form now we see that this chart looks a lot alike the one that we are supposed to create except where we need access titles so we find here in the chart design menu on the left a chart element access titles horizontal and vertically and this is time id Oops, this is W1. <clears throat> and I don't think we need a chart title. Okay, two things we can say. First, as we progress in time, so we found that a smaller time ID refers also to um, more distant in the past. So time ID 45 is more distant in the past than 57, for example. We find that as we progress in time, the exchange rate increases up to a certain point, and, that, and then it pretty much stays stable until most recently, where we had a huge jump. So from time ID 150-something to 160-something, there's a jump in the exchange rate. Secondly, what we see is in the beginning, most institutes that reply to our um, research request set pretty much the same value. So the estimate is very closely here. <clears throat> Whereas as we progress in time, the estimates diverged a lot. So there's a lot of variance in that. One bank said, I don't know this much, what is it? 128, and at least one said 170. So those are pretty much apart. And then that stabilized as well. So here, estimates are more closely related again until most recently where it got spread out and dispersed again. So this is as much as we can say to the development in the financial markets. And if I should have a guess, and there's some abnormally in the market, whether it might be a crisis or a there's a problem in that country or in the relationship of the two countries. I don't know, we, sh we, we could dig into that by reading the, the like latest news. Um, but apart from that, we cannot tell what it is. We can just say that there is something. And that is it for problem 13. Thanks for watching. I'll do a quick recap of what you learned. So let me see. What we've done here so far. So first, we had a course overview. Second, in the first video referring to Excel, we had first steps, how to navigate in the tables, um, what are workbooks, how to write easy calculations starting with equal signs, what is the difference between absolute and relative references. In the third video, what a calculation on a net present value, so basically a small business plan. And I introduced you to functions, pre-built functions in Excel. Of course, they're not limited. So you could use Visual Basic for applications, the programming language behind Excel, and write your own functions if you wanted. Um, we elaborated then on diagrams and charts, especially line charts. I think in functions, we used the bar chart already. Anyway, we went to line charts, saw how to edit several parts of the charts, how to include or extend the charts by legends or titles or, I don't know, a second vertical axis. And now in the last video, I showed you some applications. So first we had Occam's Law, followed by a, tr a transposition of a matrix with a matrix function. Um, that might become handy if you use, for example, SAP in the controlling department and you get row-wise data that you want to transform. And then lastly, we had a practical example on a survey evaluation that could be 
something you might want to do as a seminar paper or a research paper in form of your thesis, for example. I wish you best of luck. Have fun in the course, um, in your studies, and all the best.